This is When Gen X Ruled the Multiplex, where I look at the films that played some part in shaping the worldview of those of us who were born in the general range of 1965 to 1980. Generation X is also sometimes known as the MTV generation, and today's film is a pure and uncut product of MTV's glory days. Duran Duran's glorious mess of a sci-fi themed concert film, 1985's Arena, an absurd notion. Arena was directed by Russell Mulcahy, who at the time was best known as a prolific and highly sought after director of music videos. In addition to directing the iconic videos for some early Duran Duran hits, including Rio and Hungry Like the Wolf, he worked with artists such as Elton John, Bonnie Tyler, Ultravox, and The Buggles, and many more. In the early years of the 1980s, Mulcahy did as much as any single individual in establishing what we now think of as the look of the 80s. At the time of Arena, he'd already directed one feature, the horror film Razorback from 1984. In 1986, he would direct Highlander, the compulsively watchable cult classic that launched a long-standing film and television franchise. He's worked steadily ever since, returning to his MTV roots in recent years as an executive producer of the MTV series Teen Wolf. For the uninitiated, Duran Duran are new wave stalwarts from Birmingham, England, who at the time of Arena had already been around for five years and had been super duper famous since the release of their second album, 1982's Rio. Arena was filmed during the North American leg of their sold out Sing Blue Silver Tour in 1984 when they were riding an ever growing wave of pop superstardom, dominating the airwaves and packing stadiums. While they've never recaptured their global domination of the mid 80s, they're still together almost 40 years later, recording new music and touring the world. The the 1984 incarnation of Duran Duran seen in Arena is comprised of gregarious frontman Simon Le Bon, the bon vivant, bassist John Taylor, everybody's crush, drummer Roger Taylor, the quiet one, guitarist Andy Taylor, the loose cannon and the only one of this original lineup who is not currently a member of Duran Duran, and keyboardist Nick Rhodes, the enfant terrible in that he is the youngest and most avant-garde of the Durans. When I grow up, I want to be Nick Rhodes. Duran Duran took their name from a character in Roger Vadim's 1968 erotic sci-fi extravaganza Barbarella, the evil doctor Durand Durand, played by Irish actor Milo O'Shea. Barbarella starred a young Jane Fonda as an intrepid space explorer who battles ne'er-do-wells while looking fabulous in bathing suits and knee boots. Barbarella is a swanky, sexy, stylish film with some great visuals and a healthy dose of surrealism, and thus it gave Duran Duran the perfect foundation upon which to build their image. Duran Duran are swanky, sexy, and stylish, and they immediately saw how they could use MTV to get that precise image out to the general public through their surreal and visually stunning music videos. That brings us to Arena, which oddly enough serves as a de facto sequel to Barbarella. Milo O'Shea returns as the power-mad Dr. Durand Durand, inventor of the positronic ray, who, following his defeat by Barbarella, was banished to the psychedelic void. He's recently been awakened from an eternal slumber by the sound of thousands upon thousands chanting his name in Oakland, California. He heads to Earth to greet what he believes are his devoted followers. And of course, what he finds are a quintet of highly photogenic lads from Birmingham, England, who have stolen Durand Durand's name. So Durand Durand holds himself up in a surprisingly spacious lair underneath the Oakland Coliseum. This is part of the set of Durand Durand's extravagant Wild Boys video filmed on the enormous 007 stage at Pinewood Studios in England. The set is sprawling and ramshackle and dystopian. It's a little bit Blade Runner and a little bit Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome. It's also very precarious and leaky and there are glass tanks filled with, I don't know, urine or whatever lying about. God knows why this would exist under the Oakland Coliseum. For whatever reason, Duran Duran is walking around on all fours with long precarious stilts attached to his arms and legs, which seems like a wildly impractical form of transportation but it's a great visual, so I'm okay with it. He's accompanied by an unnamed henchman played by Malcolm Dixon, a person of short stature who also appeared in 80s genre favorites Time Bandits, Return of the Jedi, The Dark Crystal, Labyrinth, and Willow. Durand Durand settles into a control room surrounded by monitors that give him a view of the stage above, and which are currently showing a short barrage of clips from Barbarella, culminating with the iconic line, a good many dramatic situations begin with screaming. This segues immediately into the screaming of thousands of fans, mostly teens, mostly young women, as Duran Duran take the stage and launch into their number one standalone single from 1983, Is There Something I Should Know? The set design for the Sing Blue Silver Tour with those inflatable Doric columns is pretty effective. If you are a Duran connoisseur, you have also seen this set in the tour footage used in their video for The Reflex, as well as in their excellent tour documentary, Sing Blue Silver. Most of Arena is concert footage, about which I won't have too much to say other than to point out that Duran Duran are playful and charismatic performers who have a knack for grabbing attention 
attention on stage. They look like they're having a blast on this tour. During the performance, Nick becomes momentarily distracted by the appearance of Durant Durant's face on the display screen of his Fairlight CMI synthesizer. If you'll think back to my analysis of Liquid Sky a few weeks ago, you'll remember I talked about the Fairlight CMI and its contribution to the sound of the 80s. Throughout Arena, you can see Nick extensively using his Fairlight on stage. When it was released onto the market in 1979, a Fairlight CMI cost $32,000. So it's a mark of the success of Duran Duran at this time that Nick was able to own one and to make it such an integral part of Duran Duran's live performances. I love Nick's sheer amount of gear. He always has an entire pop-up radio shack surrounding him in his corner of the stage. From beneath the Coliseum, Duran Duran now has three armored little people doing his evil bidding. They take the elevator up to stage level and embark upon an evil scheme to disrupt the concert. Or something. Honestly, the details of Duran Duran's plot are extremely vague, partly because the sound mix of Arena is such that the dialogue is sometimes impossible to understand, and partly, I suspect, because everyone was just kind of making it up as they go along. It is very telling that Arena has a plot, and it has dialogue, but it has no credited screenwriter. While the band performs Hungry Like the Wolf, the henchmen release a tiger into the audience, who transforms back and forth into a sexy woman in a bathing suit and body paint. As anyone who's ever seen the Mulcahy-directed video for Hungry Like the Wolf knows, sexy women who transform into sexy giant cats is very on-brand for Duran Duran. While performing, Simon wanders off the stage and finds himself at a moonlit pyramid, surrounded by palm trees and tigers and more sexy women in body paint. He's relatively unfazed by this and eventually wanders back on stage to finish the song. Next up, Union of the Snake, during which, for some unfathomable reason, we see a pair of cyborgs frantically grinding on each other in a pool of green goop. I gather they're part of Durand Duran's scheme and they're supposed to, I don't know, attack the Durands or whatever, but all they do is copulate in green goop while computer commands scroll across a monitor. If you're a stickler for coherent narratives, you probably shouldn't be watching a Duran Duran concert film. We then get a wistful and lovely performance of Save a Prayer, during which Simon poses attractively with an acoustic guitar. John Taylor's services on bass are not required for this song, so he goes out into the hallway looking all sweaty and smoldering, and slurps down a Heineken while making meaningful eye contact with a cute female fan. Dr. Durant Durant summons a mysterious force to surround the fan and drag her off into the bowels of the Colosseum. John is mildly confused by this, but decides not to investigate. The cute fan winds up in a cage suspended on chains from the ceiling in Duran Duran's lair. And then we reach the indisputable showpiece of Arena, the extended version of the Wild Boys video. At a cost of over a million pounds, this was, at the time, the most expensive music video ever made. Russell Mulcahy had optioned the rights to William Burroughs' violent and feverish and intensely homoerotic novel The Wild Boys, The Book of the Dead, with an eye towards making it into a feature film. This video was meant to serve as a calling card for that project, which never came together. But the video is dazzling and extravagant and totally bananas. It features the Durans in a sprawling underground dystopian hellscape, being menaced by dancing, scantily clad mutants while stuck in cheeky bondage predicaments. Simon is tied to a giant windmill that dunks his head into the water with every rotation. Nick is trapped in a cage. John is strapped down across the hood of a car and tormented with projected images of his own beautiful, beautiful face. Andy is bound up in the scaffolding, and Roger is stuck in a hot air balloon. The Durans have explained this video as being a metaphor for feeling trapped by their level of fame and forced to perform, and that makes a lot of sense. But you can also feel free to skip the metaphor and just enjoy seeing the Durans in bondage. The version of this video shown in Arena is longer than the MTV version and also contains some additional footage, including some dicey special effects and also some boobs because there is a topless wild girl in this version who is played by dancer-singer Perry Lister, Billy Idol's former longtime partner. One of the most striking elements of the Wild Boys video is its use of a deeply menacing and creepy animatronic head. Funny story about that head. This isn't 100% verified, and it seems almost too perfect to be true, but I've looked into it and it seems to pan out. The animatronic head, along with all the other creature prosthetics in Arena, is the work of special effects makeup artists Nick Maley and Bob Keane, both of whom also worked on the Vampires in Space box office bomb Life Force, which was directed by Texas Chainsaw Massacre director Toby Hooper, and which was also filmed at the 007 stage at Pinewood Studios in February of 1984. Russell Mulcahy, who was friends with Toby Hooper, had visited the set of Life Force before filming Arena and had borrowed a prop, a rubber cast of the head of one of the actors in Life Force, to use as the animatronic head in Arena. That actor? Sir Patrick Stewart. 
If you've ever thought that the animatronic head in Wild Boys looks suspiciously like Captain Jean-Luc Picard, it's because it is Captain Jean-Luc Picard. Hat tip to Christian Mazeltov, Chris F. on Twitter, who was the first person to tell me about this, and it blew my mind. During a performance of Planet Earth, the evil Durand Durand starts zapping fans with his positronic rays. From the stage, the band fails to notice anything amiss. They will also fail to notice when Dr. Durand Durand's minions trap fans in nets on the concert floor and drag them off screaming to their underground lair. There's a persistent theme to Arena about how you can get violently attacked by strange creatures during a concert, and Durand Durand will do jack all to save you. Nothing much happens during a performance of Careless Memories, apart from some artistic close-ups of Simon pretty eyes. Things get a little livelier during Girls on Film, which features a slew of lingerie-clad women on roller skates who careen around a rink roller derby style while engaging in eroticized shenanigans. If you've seen the Band from MTV version of the official Girls on Film music video, the one with the mud wrestling and the pillow fighting and the champagne poured over breasts, you know that this is a song that cries out for eroticized shenanigans. I said earlier that Duran Duran are swanky, sexy, and stylish. I'm going to add super horny to that description. Simon somehow wanders off stage mid-performance, as he is prone to do, and winds up in the middle of the rink, where the roller girls alternately kiss him and punch him, which was probably a pretty standard Tuesday night for Simon Le Bon in 1984. He returns to the stage to finish the song. Back in the rink, the roller girls are chased and attacked by leather-clad thugs, who drag them off to the subterranean lair, where they end up chained upside down over the containers of murky liquid, which contains some ghastly-looking humanoid creatures. During an especially catchy Nile Rodgers produced remix of The Reflex, a group of spunky fans enter the subterranean lair and save the roller girls from getting eaten by the creatures. On his precarious stilts, Dr. Durand Durand shoots flames at the fans, and they shield themselves behind a Durand Durand poster and use it to bounce the flames back onto him. And it is all very… what's the word I'm looking for? Dumb. It's very dumb. On fire, Durant Durant topples off his stilts, and while the underground lair is consumed in flames, he howls, I only wanted to be loved. And credits roll while everyone in the Coliseum bops around to Duran Duran's much-loved hit Rio, even though there are explosions and like a four-alarm fire going on just beneath them. Arena was released on VHS in 1985. There's also another version of Arena known by the title As the Lights Go Down, which aired on ITV and Cinemax. As the Lights Go Down is Arena stripped of the Dr. Duran Duran framing device, and it also has a slightly different set list. It's worth noting for two things. A brief and blurry appearance by future Academy Award winner Jennifer Connelly, who wanders across the stage during a performance of The Seventh Stranger, and an excellent performance of the chauffeur in which the Durans dangle from giant animal bones, which seems like it would have fit right in with the weirdness of Arena. Arena, you may have gathered, is messy. The big flaw of Arena, however, is one born out of necessity, in that the Durans are almost entirely confined to the performance footage. Simon and John are the only Durans to ever venture off the stage, and that's only for brief moments. The band members were overextended from their extensive world tour, and from filming videos, and from an ambitious publicity circuit, and thus they didn't have the time to commit to Arena beyond performing on stage. That's a shame, because the band members are Arena's most valuable resource. Being able to incorporate them into the framing device would have really elevated it into something special. The climax of Arena, with the spunky fans taking down Durand Durand, is both dumb and unsatisfying. The band members should be the protagonists of Arena, and in order for Arena to work as both a concert film and as a feature film, the Durands themselves needed to play a greater role in that climax. Right from the start, Durand Durand were incredibly sappy about what music videos can and should accomplish. In the early days of MTV, a successful music video would be broadcast repeatedly, airing several times each day. And thus it was a mistake for artists to approach making a video the same way you'd approach making a short film, in that short films are generally intended to be understood after a single viewing. Duran Duran understood very early on that keeping music videos enigmatic and surreal turned them into puzzles for the viewer, and thus the viewer would look forward to seeing them again and again in the hopes of adding to their understanding of that puzzle. MTV taught Gen X to be very comfortable with the cryptic and the surreal. If things don't make sense, that's a feature, not a bug. Arena, and particularly the Wild Boys video inside of it, does this very successfully. As many times as you watch Arena, you will never really have a handle on what's going on, and that's by design. I hate self-promotion, which is a quintessential Gen X character trait right there, but as you've probably gathered, I have a great many thoughts on Duran Duran, and in particular on their contribution to the look and sound of the 80s. If you'd like to hear more from me, you can always visit my website, www.morganrichter.net, 
Or you can read my book, Duranalysis, Essays on the Duran Duran Experience, which can be purchased at Amazon or ordered from the independent bookseller of your choice. Next time, I'm going to examine good old-fashioned 80s capitalism and materialism in the 1983 classic, Risky Business. Thank you for joining me today, and I hope to see you then.